morning, everyone. It is Monday, December 5th. Uh, here in, I'm Mayor Chris Jensen here in Noblesville with my good friend Kristen Boyce, the owner of Pathways to Healing Counseling. And this is another edition of Mental Health Monday. Good morning, Kristen. How are you this morning? I'm wonderful. Good morning, Mayor Jensen. Happy to be here. I'm so excited for our talk today. Yes, I'm really excited about it. So we are here today to kind of continue the conversation around mental health. It is the month of December and nothing screams mental health and mental well-being like the holidays, right, Kristen? There's there's oh, just a lot yes. going on. So much going on. So much going on. I'm glad yes. we're having this talk. Yes, this is good. So we are so honored to have you with us here today. Uh, today, we're going to cover kind of the five P's that keep you stuck in disconnection and depression. So I was looking at my cheat sheet there for a little bit there for you. So this is this is a great thing. I love I love easy tricks like this to kind of go over some uh, some quick tips and some ideas on how we can work ourselves through some depression, especially this time of year. So but before we get on any of those topics, we're going to talk a little bit about square breathing, one of my favorite exercises, and I'll let you take us through that exercise, Kristen. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that we can do this together. This is an exercise I recommend if you're just joining for the first time that you start immediately. And what it does is it helps center you in the present moment and re-regulate your nervous system. We start with placing our feet on the floor. We take a big inhale through our nose, kind of belly to the spine. We're going to inhale for four, hold for four to count. You can either count one, two, three, four in your head. And then we're going to slowly exhale out our mouths like we're cooling a cookie for the little kids or cooling soup and on, for eight counts. And what we're doing is we're recalibrating, recentering if you're feeling anxious. If you're feeling anxious, that's usually because you're thinking about the future. If you're feeling depressed, there's something probably unprocessed in the past. And the breath can help bring you into the present and center and ground you into your body, which oftentimes we disconnect from. It's so important that we're connecting to our bodies and our nervous system. So let's do two breaths together. We'll start with feet on the floor, pressing into your feet so you can really center your nervous system. Big deep inhale through your nose. Hold and slow exhale. I'm really slowing us down because we're going at such a fast pace nowadays. If you're holiday shopping, if you're feeling anxious about gifting, hosting for the holidays, family, try this. Every hour, five breaths. Let's do one more together. Big, deep inhale through your nose, belly to the spine, and release. I really kind of feel like I'm letting all the air out of the balloon. So we get the full benefit of a deep breath. The more shallow breathing we have, the more anxious we're feeling. So you really have to cue your brain to get more intentional about taking that big, deep inhale through your nose. This is an exercise that I preach all the time about. It's something that is so easy to do, especially this time of year. I was using it a lot last week. Personal antidote, my Julie Jensen was in Florida for a girl's trip last week, which was awesome for her. I was so happy for her to get away. Um, but so it was me and my four awesome children who rocked it, did phenomenal, but there were still some logistical things we had to work through. And so we did a lot of square breathing. And I think I've told you before, my almost six-year-old Hank will be six on Friday. He, uh, this is a great example if you are a parent that, you know, our kids mimic our behavior so much. Um, and even this weekend, I was at a basketball game. My mom, who I'm sure is watching, will laugh. But I told Hank he needed to, to settle down for a second. And he just started doing some deep breathing right on my lap, which was just adorable. But again, shows you, you can model that behavior. And if kids can catch on, if, if Hank Jensen can catch on at five years old, uh, that makes me really happy because I do think that'll help him regulate some of his emotions going forward. It'll change his life. Yeah. Honestly, it'll change his life because we all are going to go through pain. It's, those are givens. We're going to go through pain. Yep. We're going to have trials and tribulations. And if they, we know how to equip our children on how to move through it and take care of ourselves, 
in the midst of it, there's no greater gift. So yeah. happy birthday, Hey! Happy birthday, Hey! Yes, six years old, hard to believe. So uh, before we get into kind of these five Ps, which I think is just a great, uh, great topic. I'm excited that we're tackling here a little bit today. But I wanted you to kind of, first of all, first of all, if you have any questions, if anyone's watching the show while we're here live, feel free to type those in. If you want to say good morning, that's great too. We'd love to hear from folks. Uh, we know we have folks all around the world who, who tune in. So feel free to chime in at any point in time. If we don't have the answers while we're on the show, we'll follow up with you later and get some get some help uh, needed to you at that point in time. But also, um, you hit on something in the intro to this topic that I think is something that we've driven home a little bit over the last couple of years, but it's the difference between anxiety and depression. Uh, do you want to kind of recap that again? Yeah, it is important for us to notice. So the question is for everybody listening, kind of ask yourself, when you have emotions come up, Am I worried about the future? Am I thinking about, are my thoughts focused on the future, which is anxiety? Or am I really focused on the past and maybe regrets, some sadness, maybe some unprocessed trauma? That really leads us towards depression. That means we've suppressed probably because we didn't know how to process it in real time, or maybe it wasn't safe to do that. And so when you kind of recognize the difference between am I in the future and worrying about what's coming and the what ifs, or am I in the past depressive, kind of feeling in a depressed state, not real motivated right now, I'm seeing a lot of depression and anxiety. This time of year, typically we're going to see more depression because we have holidays, we have family, we have grief and loss, we have unprocessed traumas that are coming to the surface. And it's so important that we be kind and gentle to ourselves because we're our worst critic. We're like beating ourselves up and we're like, well, you know, it's not that bad. Look at so-and-so, they have it worse. And we're like kind of bypassing our own way to process the pain and what's underneath. Well, I think, again, if you're sitting there wondering like, oh, I've never really thought of that. We're not expecting you to probably think of that in the midst of anxiety or depression. Um, I don't want people to think, but it, but it is, if you can take a step back, if you're tuning in today, you probably have an interest in mental health and well-being. You know, taking a moment to think about where your thoughts really manifest themselves. I think it's just an interesting topic to, to kind of examine. It's something that I had not really thought about before. Um, you know, kind of that forward thinking versus backward thinking. So um, anyways, great, great example there. So we're going to talk about the five P's that like get us stuck in depression and disconnection. So um, I'm going to let you kind of walk us through one P at a time. Um, and obviously you probably have some questions about each one of those as we work ourselves through. And this is what I've taught my kids because it's, you know, I love acronyms. I like yep. ways to teach that cue your brain to help us remember and become more self-aware. I love expansion and an opening of thinking differently. So let's just jump in and let's start with, and these are no particular. Well, I, will, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I always say, I, I always talk about when people feel fine, feelings inside, not expressed. That's one thing that's like totally drilled into me by you over the past two years. So I love a good acronym here or some good trick for the brain. It does. Cause it, you're like, Oh yes. And that's, that's one of the, things we're going to talk about today when we say we're fine it's a way we've learned to yeah. placate which will yeah. be we'll just jump into number one placate. placation what is placation i'm going to give you some examples because i've seen this more coming to the surface with couples than i have ever seen before so i'll have couples come in and to avoid conflict fighting discord they just want harmony and peace. I mean, we want it just to be kumbaya. And in reality, what we do then, and we learn this as a child, oftentimes with teachers, with coaches, with family systems, we learn to give the answer that we think the parent wants to hear or that the part, it looks like you got things. Come, you're, <laughs> yeah, I got, I got some thoughts in a minute, but you keep going. And so we say what we think the person wants to hear and we bypass sharing our own truth. And I don't mean vomit on somebody. I mean, sharing the true, vulnerable, transparent way you feel. And so let me give you an example. So if a couple says, what do you need? And the person says, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't really need anything. It's almost like that they're not consciously doing this, but they're almost like, I don't want to even start this because what if you pick apart what I need or you shift blame it back to me and say, well, you don't do that for me. You know, you don't, you know, empty the dishwasher without being asked. And so they kind of flip it. And so people don't want to get into it. So it's easier just to say, I don't, I don't have any needs. I don't know. 
um, I'm fine. You already expressed, we already went into what I'm fine is or telling the person what they want to hear. That's placation. And what I'm finding, here's the end result. So we play the movie out. We placate our whole lives. Then we're in a marriage for 20, 25 years. And this is the reality I'm seeing. And they're feeling disconnected and despair like they don't really because they were never authentically showing up with their true thoughts feelings wants and needs and so they feel like they're just almost like not disgusted but almost like it's such a disconnect and then when i say well have you shared how you feel they look deer in headlights like ooh, that's going to create conflict they're going to get upset they're going to get mad and so they don't want to do that what are your thoughts on placation? Yeah, so I was, I was sorry, I kept smirking because I just like play so many scenarios in my head uh, through this. And uh, like, you know, I, I was curious, can you tell, well, first of all, I'm gonna say the whole fine example. I it, I found it interesting a few times. I And I always, when anybody tells me they're fine now, I'm always like, oh, feelings excited, not expressed. And I've had a few people throw it back at me the last couple months and be like, yep. And I'm like, okay, like, but you know what I mean? like. Kudos to that. Like that is where they are at. And at least it got them thinking like, yeah, that's where I'm going to, that's the answer I'm going to give you. And I'm like, all right, you know, I, I have to be respectful of that. You know what I mean? Like at least I rose it to the surface that I know there's something else underneath there. You don't have to tell it to me. That's totally fine. But at least you've thought it through. And so I just kind of had to chuckle about that. And I give kudos to people who, you know, again, are willing to throw it back at me on that one. So, um, and then play Katie, is it possible asking for a friend to be a placator in your marriage, but not a placator in other scenarios like at work? For sure. Okay. For sure. Because <laughs> Romain. <laughs> so like, okay. Good, 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 good. Yeah, good. Because what a marriage does is there's a lot more vulnerability in the marriage. There's a lot more uh, intimacy in a marriage that is not necessarily in a work relationship. And I'll see this a lot. I'll see people show up differently in a work relationship, rather in their marriage. I'm like, why do I do that? There's such a different, you live with this person 24 seven. I mean, there's a, such a different dynamic. You're parenting together, perhaps you're doing life together. You're living together. No one taught us how to live with someone else. No one taught us really how to be in an intimate relationship. Truly, I mean, if you really think about it, we didn't learn how to communication skills, share our feelings, acknowledge one another. What do we do with the differences and how do we work them out? So placation becomes the default that seems easier than having discord. But what it does, it ends up leading towards just kind of a dead end road and almost feeling dead inside in the relationship if it's pervasive. If you do it every now and again, you're going to notice a disconnected feeling if you really are aware of it. And sometimes it just feels easier. You know, it's just like, sure. it's just easier. And so until it's not until you wake up and go, Oh, this, this is not creating what I want in, in my relationships. Yeah. I just like I said, think, brother, cause I, I think I definitely could be a prey uh, placator in my marriage at times uh, for that peace and harmony type situation but I, I i think my team would probably tell you here at city hall that i'm not a placator most of the time so uh, i was just curious about the differentiation and that's helpful to think about it is so my husband's more of a placator i would say in the same realm yeah. at home and so i would spend he would used to say fine all the time and i was yeah. like what do you really feel i really want to know the truth and i can handle it but that was hard because it was like, ooh, what if I say something, you're going to take it the wrong way or I'm going to hurt you or you're going to get upset. And so we've really had to work on it. It's a safe environment for you to tell me the truth and I can handle it and I can tolerate it and I can self-soothe through it, even if it hurts. That's a big part of learning to share is feeling safe enough to be able to tell the truth and be transparent and not have the other person get so dysregulated. And even if, if they do, you're like, okay, it's okay. I can handle it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's go to number two. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Placator. That was just that we still had a long, a lot of time on there, but it was, it's, it's a good a, one. It's a really big one yeah. and a really important one because it's a way to stay safe and protect yourself from blame, shame, judgment, disconnection, and rejection. We think. We think it's self-protective. All of these we think are self-protective. I want to make a note of that. We think we're protecting ourselves from those things or abandonment. And what we're really doing is we're creating what we don't want. Loneliness, disconnection, really in depression because we're suppressing our truth 
in these ways that we've learned to behave. So that leads us to number two, which is perfectionism, perfecting. So if I can just do it well enough, then I don't have to feel that shame of not feeling good enough. So I work really, really hard to try to do it just perfectly. And I see this a lot in some kids now, like they think I've got to do it. And I have one perfectionistic kid that, you know, if I just do it well enough, then I won't have to feel stupid. I won't have to feel bad about myself. I will. And it actually creates what we don't want because we know shame is riding shotgun. And so here's the truth about perfectionism. It, it truly is a disconnector. Because if we, we can't connect to perfect because nobody's perfect. This is the, we're taking a risk of being vulnerable. We're taking a risk of saying, Hey, I don't have it all together. Nobody does. I'm owning my imperfections. And when we can own our imperfections, which is our humanity that sets us free and heals the shame that plagues us and drives our train. And we usually learn this pretty early in childhood from school, from parents, from society, from culture to do things. So, and we have so perfect and we see Instagram, we see social media, TikTok, all the places where they look perfect. And it's not reality. It's not truth. It's like comparing this perfect canvas yeah. that is not real to you know, the reality of being a human being and it's dangerous, especially for our teens. So perfectionism really has a hold on our society. Can you walk me through a little bit? You know, I, you made reference to kids and teens, which is great. What does perfectionism look like in, a, in a, an adult? In an adult? So in an adult, we might be high achievers. So we might think I'm going to, I'm going to get the next job. I'm going to get the next raise. I'm going to get the next um, promotion in my company. It might look like your looks, like people like get really fixated on how they look, their body image. It may be about, I'm not thin enough. I'm not fit enough. I'm not, you know, my face doesn't have the perfect, now they say snatched. I learned that as a teen mm -hmm. term. They're like, mm -hmm. it's, we're going to snatch it. I'm like, what is snatching? But <laughs> That's a whole nother conversation. But this whole idea of looking a certain way, our hair, our skin, our makeup, our physique, muscles, it can be anything. It can be related to your house. Like you're clean, cleaning your house and it's never perfect enough. It could be the decor in your home. It could be your lawn. It transfers and follows you in all realms of your life. It typically will just stay with you. And it starts pretty early in childhood. So what I have people do is I have them do kind of a perfectionism timeline. What does that mean? It means I look at, can you float back and remember when it started? It might have been in second grade when you had a project due and you want and you had to get it up in front of the class and do a poster on your project and you wanted it to look just the best in the class because then you wouldn't be judged. Maybe you get an A plus from the teacher, you get words of affirmation. So it starts pretty early on. And then we have a timeline of to see and what other areas and how old were you and how, what impact that had on you. And then what are your current patterns of perfectionism? And how is that leading you to depression? Cause you'll never hit, there's no, it's a moving target. It'll never be perfect enough. Cause yeah. we're perfect people. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like Joni uh, chimed in on are your on on some of you advocate for a lot. Brene Brown sounds like she has a good book on imperfection. So great it the imperfections. It's a great yeah. book. Yeah. Yes, thanks Joni for chiming Thank in on that. That's awesome. Good. All awesome. right. Number three, we're going to get into pretending. I see this so much. We pretend we're okay. We pretend, and this goes back to being fine. And it's almost like, have you ever heard the saying, fake it till you make it? Oh, yeah. It's big I'm pretty push. sure I use that a lot. I'll stop. <laughs> You no, know, well, this is this is training that we've been taught. Yeah. Like, and I remember listening to Zig Ziglar. I don't know if you remember yeah. Zig Ziglar. Yeah. He's a big motivational speaker. I'd put it on before I went to work. This was 25 years ago. And it would be like just positive your way through it. Like fake it till you make it. Pretend like you're and I love Zig, so there's some positives there. And it was almost like pretend you have it all together. And I did that for so long. I would yeah. just go in there and I put it, I mean, literally, I just yeah. put a smile on my face. It's masking 
yeah. what's really going on. And it would create such disconnection because I didn't really share anything. So I wasn't really connecting to my coworkers because they thought I had it all together in this perfect life, which was not true. Of course, I had bad days and sadness and grief, but I didn't share anything because I didn't want that vulnerability felt like, oh, then I'm not professional. Oh, they're going to think I don't have it all together. And it creates what we don't want again, which was that disconnection. So vulnerability has been a journey for many of us because we're afraid what people think of us and that becomes a way we live our lives masked because we're trying to mass we're trying to manage what other people think of us and here's the truth we can't and when we do vulnerability we feel like well now they're going to think xyz of me no that's leading us to number four which is projection so Can I pause real quick and ask about yes, pretending real quick before please. you go to projection, uh, even though it was a wonderful segue there that I just interrupted you on. But um, placate versus pretending. Placating, would that be more of like a between individuals where pretending is kind of more masking yourself? Yes. So okay. that's a good distinction. So placation yeah. is more verbally. I'm going along with things yeah. to make you happy. Yeah. So then I don't have to feel discomfort of you know, this, you discord, or, yeah. you know, you being upset with me, we're pretending is more like I'm masking, Got which it. could, you could say is similar, but it's masking just my behavior in general, my Got affect it. in general. Got it. Yep. I just wanted to pull a parallel there. Cause there's, there are some similarities, but I was, I, I learned better too, if I pull back and kind of talk about them uh, simultaneously. So perfect. I love that. Cause that helps everybody else to go, yeah. okay, well, what's the difference between yep. these two? Yep. So we go to projecting. Projecting is so important. I cannot emphasize this enough. What is projecting? Projecting means I am putting how I feel or what thoughts I have onto another person. And I am convinced that that's what they think or feel when I have literally no idea. I will have people come in, couples especially. They'll be like, I know, I'll say it, but I know what they're going to say. And that may be true, right? Because we've lived with the person for so long, we kind of have an idea. And what I'm doing is I'm more interested in breaking patterns of projection and tolerating that the other person it may have the response that they have. So when I recognize I'm projecting, usually there's a shame story that goes along with it. What's a shame story? A shame story says, I'm thinking about what they think of me and they think I'm stupid. They think I'm not good enough. They think I'm going to think that they're, you know, X, Y, Z. I'm putting, I'm projecting, think of it like I am a laser beam putting thoughts into their head or their feelings. And I'm tell I'm convinced that that's what they think. If I would say, if I would say how I really feel, then they're going to get mad, which they could. And they're going to think I'm an idiot, which we don't necessarily know. But what if I don't do that? I'll tell you, if you don't show up with your true authentic self, you will never, and I do mean never, and I rarely use that word, will feel a deep connection with the other person. You just won't because there's nothing to connect to. It's not, I'm, I've got almost like a barrier there to connection. So if I'm with somebody and I'm convinced that they think I'm an idiot and I'm projecting that they're upset with me when really they're not upset with me, but I'm convinced that they are, there's this white elephant dynamic and we're not really connecting. The other person has no idea that I'm feeling like they think I'm an idiot. And so now there's not an ability to connect and it's tolerating that people can have their own thoughts, feelings, and opinions. And I can't control that. It's a surrender. <coughs> when we have projection, there is an invitation for surrender because you uh, control is an illusion. You can't control what other people think of you. That's hard. That is hard. Um, how is, is that similar to, you know, we've talked in the show about like the story you're telling yourself. You know, yes. we're, we're about some, is that the same, are we walking on the same path there? We're walking a very similar path because okay. oftentimes with projection comes with story writing. Yeah. And so we could feel like my, for example, let's take another example with parenting. This is so important. Okay. Let's say your kid is at the lunchroom table. And I love this because this is true life is at the lunchroom table 
sitting by themselves and nobody will, they come home and they're like, nobody will sit with me. Now my middle school self is starting to project how I would feel if I was sitting alone. Okay. Instead of me asking, how are you feeling? You know, what, what do you, what's going on for you? Tell me what that was like. I'm going, oh yeah. Gosh, I hate that feeling. And I remember when I was in sixth grade, oh, that feels awful. And you must feel really angry and sad. And, and they haven't even said how they feel, but I'm already projecting my own experience of being a sixth grader onto my kid without them getting the chance to process what they feel. Big difference. That's why I love when parents can get curious rather than go into lecture mode. Or preach and teach because that's coming from their own place of inner child that's coming from their own stuff yeah we have a you're hitting a lot really close to home we have a sixth grader at home and there's this i'm just smirking by hearing these things there's so many applicable pieces to what you just said right there um and honestly you know julie jensen and i have talked a lot last couple of years or so about uh storytelling and, and kind of like trying to call that out in the moment at times with but on both sides of like you know i think what you, you know you're telling yourself this and you're not hearing me and, and vice versa and, and trying to call it out in the moment which has been at least helpful for us to acknowledge that's so huge yeah, yeah. That's, so hu that's, oh. that's huge progress yeah. That's a, that's the benefit of P these five P's and working yeah. through them. I know we haven't gotten to the fifth, but we get to progress. Yeah. We get to process it. So those are my other, other side of the P's, yeah. There's more P. them, you know, process and we get progress. progress. Which Love is it. Amazing. Okay. Fifth the one. last, the last one we didn't get to. So we got projecting, placating, perfecting, performing. Did we get to performing? We didn't get to performing. Performing is number five. There you go. So, okay. Performing is when you, it's similar to pretending, but we're at a bigger, I would say, here's the, the level up of pretending. Performing almost is I'm, I'm a different person. Like acting on it. I'm acting as if I'm this person. When in reality, I'm more like really not, I don't really like people. I don't really, I'm introverted but I'm pretending I'm performing as if I'm outgoing. And some of these are social skills that we learn, but really when we're not being our authentic selves and we're taking on a different persona that isn't authentic, that's what I'm talking about. When I say performing, I'm not being my authentic self. I'm being who I think these people want me to be. And so there's a lot of disconnection, loneliness, and depression that comes with that. So a lot of work I do is helping people be who they really are, not taking the masks off, not pretending we don't perform. We start connecting and nurturing the parts of us that are really who we are, not the condition yeah. parts, not the program parts, the authentic parts. And by working on that, you really then take away that last P, the performing P. You take you, a lot of these are started to be yeah. stripped away. Now, some of them will keep coming up because they're just lifelong journey patterns. Um, placation in particular, perf perfecting and masking that pretending can be kind of ones that keep coming up and projection for sure. Is well, a and, and, you know, performing, that's not something that we're talking about like. I don't feel like going to a party tonight, but I'm going to go to a party and I'm going to put on my best self tonight because I just need to get through it. Like, that's not what you're talking about because there probably are situational times where you're just going to muster yourself through something. You're talking a much broader, more self-identity. Yes, yes self-identity where I have kind of abandoned my authentic self to be this person that I doesn't feel really like it's me. Yeah. And I'm miserable because of it. Cause I yeah. don't really, that's, I'm not connecting with anyone cause I'm not really myself. Right. I'm connecting with myself. Yeah. And then the yeah. benefit, I know we're out of time. The benefit of this is again, we get to process and which makes, we make progress when we yeah. start to recognize and get curious about these five P's. This isn't all or nothing. Definitely not an all or nothing. As we learn through our work together, like just in general mental health, the all or nothing, right, wrong, good, bad thinking takes us down the depressive and anxietal rabbit hole. Yep. It's yep. more gray. It's more yes. expansive. And that allows compassion, grace, and empathy to come through. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. I hope anyone who's listening today probably can hear a, at least AP that might be manifesting itself in their life. But I mean, for me, there are several pieces of several P's that live with inside me, you know, uh, every single day that I'm working on. So uh, I, I love this conversation and it's just, it's a great 
refreshing message as we head to the end of December um, and, and to a new year next year to kick off, which I'm excited to have that conversation too. So uh, before we wrap up here, Kristen Boyce, if someone's listening to this today, if they are still just in a very, very bad spot, where does somebody turn to help right now? Right now, you can call or text 988. This is the new national mental health crisis hotline. If you're with somebody or you yourself are struggling, please reach out to 988. There are trained clinicians that are there to help you. You don't have to walk through this alone. You matter. You're important. You're enough and you're loved. The shame wants to tell you different messages. And this is the time to really tend to yourself as we're entering this holiday season. It's awesome. Well, in spirit of the holiday season, join us for one last uh, Mental Health Monday of 2022 in two weeks, the week of Christmas. Perfect time for you to invite a friend to join us in that conversation, and we'll get you through the holidays with some great tools towards the end of the year. But in the meantime, Kristen Boyce, you're the best. Thanks for being here today, and everyone stay safe.